Hi, Stephen here for The Idiot Quilter and here's another interview in my series of interviews with subscribers. Enjoy! Okay, great. So today on St The Idiot Quilter Presents, we have Adrienne Bennett and uh, well, we're just going to get right into it and find out everything we need to know about Adrian. So Adrian, what's your name? Well, it's Adrian Bennett. And where are you from? Um, I'm currently living a little bit north of Richmond, Virginia. Oh, okay. And uh, so I guess, how long have you been quilting and or sewing? Or do you do both? Um, I'm not a quilter per se. I'm a sewer slash milliner. I've been sewing for about 55 years. Oh, wow. I started when I was 12. And the hat making, I think I started like in 2004. Mm, okay. And what got you into hat making? Well, I have a picture of my grandmother. Uh-huh. And she's in a 1910 tea dress with a Titanic era type of hat. Yeah. And I thought that was fabulous looking. So I thought, well, I'll make a 1910 tea dress. So I started doing research on that and I started the dress. But then I realized after my research that it wasn't about the dresses they wore. It was about the hats. Okay. <laughs> and so my husband found this hat making class at a local fabric store and signed me up for it and surprised me with it. I went to the class and let's just say I've now completed like 500 hats and the tea dress is still not finished. <laughs> <laughs> and I noticed behind you on your wall, you have some framed pictures of period piece costumes, I guess. Um, actually... Those are original artwork that another crafter was selling at a venue I attended. And I really thought it was cool. And I bought the series of four and thought someday I'll have them in my craft room on the wall. And so you do. I do. So I guess they serve as inspiration then. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And I like to buy often. I'll find things other vendors have that inspire me and I'll, I'll acquire them and I'll leave them around, you know, to give me inspiration. Yeah. And in a couple of minutes, I'm going to get you to show us a couple of hats because I see them in sitting right in behind. Okay. You. But before we do that, I just want to go to another question. So you've already explained how you got into hat making and you've been uh, sewing for 55 years. So how did you get into sewing? Was it just something your mother did it and she made you do it or how'd that happen? Well, when I was 12, we moved to a neighborhood where there were no kids my age. Hmm. But there was this woman who lived behind me who was originally from Germany. In fact, she told me she was a World War II bride who would sit on her back porch. And she called me over one day and said, you look the girl, I teach you how to stitch. <laughs> so she took me under her wing and started showing me how to do um, this embroidery. And then um, my mother would never finish any project she started. No. <laughs> and I thought that was very frustrating. So I started asking her, if I bring over all the pattern pieces and the instructions, can you sort of walk me through this? Right. And then you, I'll finish my mother's projects. And so that's how I got started. And she was really good about helping me do that stuff. So I'd sit with her and do stuff and then go home and work on it. Three weeks into learning how to do stuff, my mother says to me, how did you learn how to thread that machine? <laughs> and I said, well, I took out the manual and I took the cellophane wrapper off of it and I read it, mom. <laughs> <laughs> so then was there anyone in your family that really influenced you into sewing or wall or was it just all this neighborhood lady? I'd say the neighborhood lady, really, because my mother, if I had listened to her, I would have never started it and gotten into it. But yeah, she see. found it very frustrating and she had a hard time understanding what the pattern instructions were trying to tell her mm. to do the german lady could just say oh that's what they mean do this do this <laughs> and she was really good yeah. at um teaching me the bad the bad side of that is when i entered junior high we our first assignment in the home mat sewing class was to make an a-line skirt mm. so i you know got all the stuff went to the class went home that weekend and finished the whole skirt. Well, when I came back and my instructor found out I had finished the whole project, she anticipated us taking the six weeks to finish it. Uh -oh. She was furious with me and she gave me an F in home ec for that semester. Oh, you're kidding. No. And my Jeez. mother would not support me. She said, no, you didn't listen to instructions. And so then she put me to work 
helping all the other students who didn't know how to do the sewing right. projects. Right. So well, geez, I, I was I'm always very happy when students in my class work ahead. But uh, yeah, well, different time, I guess. I, you know, it, yeah. and it's all it's all good because I actually later on influenced her to start an after school sewing club. When I told her I knew she could get more money if she sponsored a club from mm. the school board and that just picked the day the late bus is running. I got like six of my girlfriends who like to sew. Yeah. We all stayed after school and had a little sewing club. So she yeah. ended up liking me. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's a good thing. So um, let's take a look right now before I ask you the next question at some of your creations. Okay, sure. Um, this hat. I'm very proud of. This is the first hat I ever made out of cinema. That's amazing. Cinema is like a fabric. And there's yeah. many, many steps to making this hat. And I had a book that just had photographs in it that I had bought from an English people, British company on how to do this. And so I ended up making it. And I thought I did a really good job yeah. for just looking at a book. So I'm well, very I proud of this so. hat. That looks like something Queen Elizabeth would wear. <laughs> yes, it's a it's a definitely an ascot type of hat because yeah, yeah. that's you know that's why and, they make these fancy hats for and ascot. That bow on the front of it that that's incredible. Thank you. That is made out of this basically bias cut fabric that it's like a binding, and oh, then just you make it into loops. So yeah, well, it that's looks cool. more complicated than it is. Yeah. Um, this is a more recent one where I combined machine embroidery with hat making. Oh, so neat. I am machine embroidered this design on and then the flower petals are freestanding lace. Lace, yeah. Then I add it and then on the other side, there's a couple more of them, freestanding lace. And then it's like a little headband. So it's like a little platter yeah. hat. So is that sort of a type of fascinator? Yes, yes. It would definitely go into that group. And then because I like freestanding lace, here's another little fascinator with some freestanding lace flowers. Oh, cute. And then I took a class on how to do um, ribbon folding. And so here's another mm. fascinator with um, folded ribbon on it. Oh, wow. Here's another one of those. Jeez. Now, how long would something like that take you to make? Days, because there's yeah. a lot of hand stitching. Mm. Um because this was a class and I was learning it on, I mean, Zoom has right. been wonderful because I've been able to take a lot of classes from people all over the world teaching right. these different techniques. But it was a six hour class. And so it probably, I had it finished probably in two days after the class. Yeah. Um, then here's a more recent creation that's very oh. sculptural. Oh yeah, look at that. That is that's a made out of, of like a, that's like made out of like a, it looks like a placemat when it's yeah. start. And that's another class that I learned how to make these in. That's and I that's like incredible. the I like the herringbone um, weave of the straw. Yeah. So that's all straw. So you have yep. do you have to weave the straw yourself? No. OK. No. no. And what I usually say to people is, well, when you make homemade apple pie, do you grow your own apples. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, those are some poor people in the Philippines who are doing all that weaving. OK, so it comes to you what, like in a sort of a mat? Yeah. Let me grab one real quick. Okay. It'll come like this. Oh, OK. You know, maybe bigger, maybe a little bigger, but basically right. it's flat like this. And you use the center of it. You cut out the center to make the little button beret. And then because this is woven on the bias, you can just stitch this and then start twisting oh. it and stitching it. There's a lot of hand stitching in hat yeah. making, which I know you don't like hand stitching. Oh, no, I do not. <laughs> it's more a question that doesn't like me. <laughs> the other thing that I used to do is make what I call flat pattern hats. Oh, so these are right. sewn. Yeah. And then I would make a little purse that mm. goes with it. And I embroidered on my machine on that. Oh, cool. And the only reason was, is I used to have a Corgi dog and I would walk her in the neighborhood and I need something to put the little poop pouches in. Oh. <laughs> and, you know, in the sun I have, and yeah. I used to walk her every day because I had like a mile and a half in the neighborhood I used to live in. 
to walk her in. And all my neighbors knew me as Corgi Mama. They didn't even know my name. (laughs) Well, I got to say that hats are, I mean, I've never really thought about hats until I met you and you were talking about your creations, but they really are pieces of art, aren't they? Well, thank you. You know, every hat I make goes off on another tangent. It combines embroidery, sewing, and the blocking in hat making. Because, you know, in hat making... This is a block that's right. different than your quilting blocks. Yes. <laughs> that's what you use for molding and shaping. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And when I first got started, I told my husband, look, I can order a set of hat blocks from England for about 500 bucks because they're very heavy to ship. Yeah. Or I can buy you a lathe and tools and you can learn how to be a wood turner and make them for me. So Ooh. he said, give me the lathe and the tools and I'll learn how to do it. And he did. Jeez, that's so incredible. now he has stuff in galleries. I'm still doing sort of crafty <laughs> art festivals, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, geez. Well, that's really interesting too. Should be interviewing him as well. Yeah. Um, maybe <laughs> in the future one. So what's your favorite creation and why? Or do you have um, one? You know, my, my, I'll tell you my latest one is this hat because of the ribbon oh. folding I had yeah. to do on it. And that this is fabric that I covered over a buckram base. And it's a very complicated um, process because the fabric doesn't have as much give to go under these convex and concave shapes. But it came out pretty good. Oh, yeah. The ribbon is fantastic. And I made a blouse to go with it. Okay. (laughs) It's the whole thing with you, isn't it? Yeah. Accessories and I figure at the the next show I do in uh, September, I'll wear this. Yeah. So I can show people that, you know, I really did make it. I didn't just buy it and put something on it and yeah, resell it. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's fantastic. So what type of um, artist, that's what I'm going to use the word now for, because these are works of art. What kind of artist would you describe yourself as? Well, I mean, are you more traditional in your designs for your hats? Do you go more for the traditional or do you go for the more modern or are you like experimental or... Well, I consider myself, I sort of really like traditionally styled hats, traditional shapes, the traditional art form of blocking. However, I also go off on tangents. (laughs) And um, by that, I mean, like, I'll make a traditional hat and I'll say, well, how am I going to trim it? And then I thought, well, you know, I've heard about eco dyeing using leaves from your yard to leave impressions on fabric. And then I could make those into scarves using my serger to do a rolled edge on them and put them on a hat. So I end up going way off on this tangent, having to learn this whole other skill set so that I have a trim for a hat. So then I come back to the original, okay, let's move on with the hats, you know? So I'm traditional and tangential. And I'd also say somewhat of an innovator as well with all the looking at like the way you use the embroidery machine for to embellish your hats and things like that. And, and what you're talking about with natural dyeing and stuff like that. I would say that's all experimental and very innovative as well, which I believe that is what it's all about to be an artist. So, yeah, I guess um, you're right. So let's change a little bit here and talk a little bit about your work area. Do you have a dedicated area for all of this? I would assume you probably do. Well, when we moved to Richmond during COVID, um, I told my husband, I said, let's get an Amish shed and let's put it in the backyard and let's consider that my dedicated studio. So we did. We bought a 16 by 32 foot Amish shed Hmm. and he finished the inside with electricity and drywall and flooring Hmm. and We bought a window air conditioner and I have space heaters for the winter. We didn't add plumbing because that was too complicated to do. But this is my dedicated workspace and I really like it. So that's what you're in now? Yes. This is my studio. Yeah. And so that's a separate building on your property. Yeah. Wow. 10 feet from my back door. (laughs) Well, that's convenient. Yeah. I'm just looking at it right now and i'm thinking i just thought that was a room in your actual house so (laughs) wow what a great great spot in my former house i was in the basement and it was an Mm. unfinished basement right i spent a lot of time chasing bugs 
<laughs> spiders yeah. and critters and they would get into my supplies no matter what so the whole so when i'd have hats they'd smell like mothballs because right. i try to you know prevent the bugs and i said you know whatever we move into i am not going to be in another unfinished basement even though that allowed me a lot of space to spread out right. and do stuff in but i just couldn't stand i was kind of in the summer it was kind of hot down there in the winter it was kind of cold yeah so, yeah well, it, this looks like a really great space. I'm, I'm very happy. I'm very happy. My husband is such a handyman that yeah. and willing to do all this stuff for me. It's yeah. I'm very grateful. And it, it sounds big. You said what? 16 by 32. Yeah. That's now, that's big. There's a little front porch on this shed because mm. then I can sit out there when I want to use like a toxic stiffener and sit right. at a little table out there and then I don't have to worry about the fumes being inside. So wow. the actual workspace is 16 by 28. But the whole thing is 32. Well, that's still a huge space. Yeah, that's, it's nice. It's yeah, nice. Very nice. Um, so that brings me to what's your favorite tool or technique? Something you can't live without that you reach, reach for all the time? Can you and see this? Is it? Yes. You know, these it? little wire turners. It has a little hook on the end. Oh, yeah. Well, when I'm making my headbands that go inside the hat, Right. The crown of the hat. I like to insert a ribbon because I fold it over and I stitch it down. So there's like a tube and I have to yeah. fish the ribbon through the this hat band then sew it on. And then when a person buys the hat, if the hat's a little bit big, they can cinch this and tighten it up and ah. it makes the hat fit a little better. OK, but I love my little turning tool. It makes everything yeah. doing that so much easier than yeah. the old fashioned method of putting a safety pin on and trying to fish and it through. To fish it through. Yeah, So this is this is like my favorite favorite yeah. tool. So. Uh, this is interesting. This is a bit of an, an aside here, but so are all the hats you make basically the same size and then you have that part inside so they can customize it or adjust it for their particular head? Most people, most women have a 22 and a half inch size head. Oh, However, <laughs> they don't sell women's hats in anything but one size usually. Oh, okay. So I have half locks that are different head sizes. So mm -hmm. if someone comes into my studio and says, I have a really small head, I have a 20 and a half inch head. I said, I can make you a hat. Yeah. And therefore I block the crown smaller so that it'll fit them. Right. That's just to tweak a little bit. Say like somebody has a 22, 20, 22 and three quarters inch head and they have try on a 23 inch head size hat. They can cinch it in just to take up oh, the, okay. the quarter inch slack. Okay, well, I'm finding so this all So I can make very, them in different head sizes. Yeah, I'm finding this all very fascinating. Men's hats because, come in different sizes. Because I, I've never, ever thought about how a hat is made. So this is all new to oh. me. And actually, it's kind of interesting. Like, well, not kind of, it's a lot of interesting. But what I mean by that is it almost makes me want to maybe do more research on it and maybe try it myself someday. I don't know. But, uh, but anyways, okay. So if you had all the money in the world, what one piece of equipment would you invest in? You know, this is a really hard question for me to answer because I don't dream like that. I'm a very yeah. pragmatic kind of person. And so like at one point having the embroidery machine was something I really wanted. So I saved my money up and I got it. I don't have any really crazy, I like, since I'm not a quilter, I don't want a long arm. Long arm. I would never no. use it. Yeah, but, right. I don't really know what I, I guess if I hit the lottery, I would start a school to teach young people how to be milliners. Mm. That would be nice because, because of I, my teaching. Yeah. And I'm wondering too, if millinery uh, as, as a craft, uh, I, I'm assuming that it's probably not that popular anymore because, you know, you don't see, I don't know if the, in my observation, um, I don't see a lot of women wearing hats. Now, maybe that's changing. Maybe it's coming back into fashion. Again, I don't know. You would know better than I would. But um, so how is that with, you know, basically well, selling your hats? I think, I think that each country has its reasons for women wanting to buy fancy couture hats. Mm -hmm. Like England has all the horse races. So right. does Australia. But there's also the more practical side of wearing hats. Like when you go to the beach, mm. you want sun protection right. and you can have something a little bit individualistic rather than just, you know, from Walmart. And right. so 
I think that um, the younger generation, like the 30 year olds and younger are starting to appreciate the individuality of a couture hat Mm. and they want them. Um, I think women that were around in the sixties where the bouffant hairdo came in, that kind of killed the hat market. (laughs) But with Diana and Kate Middleton wearing hats, that really kind of buffered it and kind of pushed it forward. Right. So I think it is blooming. I mean, otherwise, why would I sell hats? I do. Yeah. Every time I do a show, I'm selling them. Yeah. So, well, you know, it might be like a lot of things in fashion, you know, they they always come back around, don't they? You yeah. know, and I mean, I remember yeah. in the 60s and that, like going to church, you know, a, a lady wore a hat. Yeah. for that yeah and as you said yeah. kind of the style of the 60 got away from the hats but it may be coming back and i think it may be coming back too as you said with the younger ones because those kids are always looking for something to make them stand out and what better thing than a hat but mm-hmm. so and in the eastern part of the united states they kind of have a romantic notion of western hats and they kind of like oh. those style oh, hats. Right. so i know that there's a lot of people making western styled hats that you know have interesting, interesting details to them and there's even some men who make hats are called hatters right. um there's a new technique where they burn the hat so it has like burn marks on it oh and they and they that's becoming popular but now it's not <laughs> something i would do but you know it, it's regional i think yeah i guess yeah whatever makes it stand out well okay have you ever belonged to any kind of group then that's related to making hats or any of your sewing like a guild or yeah i belong to the american sewing guild that is a national organization and they have regional chapters and they have neighborhood groups that teach different thematic things like felting group embroidery group and i go Mm. to those meetings in the richmond area i also belong to the uh, milliners guild that is based out of new york city And they, because of Zoom, we've been having more people join from other parts of the United States. And that's a very exciting group because some of those milliners are really well-known professional milliners. And so you, you benefit from that camaraderie and their expertise in helping you. They also um, have events that you can participate in um, by sending photos of your creations, which I've done a couple of those. So I, I, I really like joint belonging to these guilds. They've been very helpful. I'm sure there's lots of inspiration seeing what other people are creating as well. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. That, that's good. I didn't really think there, there would be anything associated with this, but that's how little I know about hat making. So I'm learning quite a bit here today. So my next question is then about your supplies and materials. Do you have a favorite uh, store you go to time and time again, or do you do it all online or how do you get your stuff? Um, there is no local Millinery supply place in Richmond. Mm. Everything is usually you have to go to New York City and go to the garment district or the hat making district, right. which a lot of those stores have closed, or you do online. And one of the companies I order from for hat supplies is Be Unique, and they have a Canadian website oh, okay. thing too. So they're United States, Canada, and Australia. Um, the other places that I frequent are usually in the United States because I live here, right. and um, Judith M is one place. Oh. Um, what else? A Schmalberg. They're, they're, they make these beautiful handmade flowers because mm. the, the art of French flower making is a whole nother skill set, yeah. you know, special tools and everything. Um, for sewing, I used to live in the Manassas area. So I would go to Burger Sew and Vac, Susie's Quilt Shop. And then in, in now in Richmond, there's a, there's a store called All Brands, which is on West Broad hmm. Street, which these are all like sewing machine people right. and they have some supplies and stuff. Yeah. And then there's always Joann's, which is the, well, you yeah. know, <laughs> yeah. the run of the mill. Yeah, I was just going to say the run of the mill supplies and things. Okay, so it sounds to me like with just you just just describing where you get your supplies in that, like you're talking about the French flowers and things like that. It sounds like there's a whole lot of things more it's not just a hat it's the embellishments and the things you can get for it too which that kind of thing appeals to me i love something that's a base and then you can work out from there and make it like a unique creation and that's exactly what it sounds like you're doing i mean veiling in and of itself 
there's all kinds of veiling. There's a lot of vintage veiling that people yeah. are snapping up. And there's ways to steam it and shape it. And then you can put a wire in it and make it into a brim. You can oh, scooch it up and make it nice. into like a little scoochy little flower kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. so many different things you can do with veiling. Just just that alone, alone. you know? Yeah. And yeah. Um, anyways, I was going to tell you about this. Um, there's a lady in Australia who decided to hire a bunch of people to videotape their hat making techniques. It's called Hat Academy. Oh, and I love their videos. You purchase them and then you can watch them forever and ever and ever. Oh, OK. It's kind of like what Craftsy did now yep. called Blueprint. Same yeah. idea. And so I subscribe. I have bought many of those videos and I watch them over and over again. And I've taken classes from some of those people in person mm. because of an event I attended in 2018 in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, called MMU, Millinery Meetup. Oh. And they brought these people in and taught classes. And it was very interesting. Oh, yeah. um, but the Hat Academy, if someone wanted to learn how to start, I would say invest in these videos because you can always watch them over and over and over right. again. Right. You yeah. know, and I don't know about you, but if I take a class and I'm trying to take notes and I'm trying to work on the project yeah. and then I go back later, it's like, OK, now what did she do? You know. Yeah, exactly. Yep. I, I understand what you mean by that. So, um who are your favorite experts or uh, places where you go or people you like to watch that, uh, you know, you, creates your inspiration and gives you information and all that kind of stuff? Well, Louise McDonald is one of these milliners and she's from Australia. And I think her teaching is excellent. Mm -hmm. See, that's the thing. A lot of these people can make these hats, but they can't teach. Can't teach, right. She can teach. There's a number of them in these videos who have, who have, um, um, Rebecca share is another one who's Australian who has classes and she's an excellent teacher. She's she, in fact, she designed a style of hat that Jennifer Lopez bought and had all her oh. dancers wearing in her Las Vegas show. Oh, wow. It was so cool. Yeah, really. <laughs> it sounds like just from what you're saying that, uh, hat making is, is very popular in Australia. I think it's because they have a lot of horse events. Mm, I don't think be, the yeah. run of the mill Australian necessarily is going to invest in a $400 hat to right. wear, but yeah. they do have, they're like England. They have a lot of these um, and they're regional horse shows. They're not just one. They're all over the country. Right. And so I think most of the milliners that are creating these hats are doing it for these horse show pe right. attendees because they yeah. give out prizes and stuff. So you mentioned that you go to uh, craft fairs or that to sell your hats. Um, do you have a website or anything where people? Yes, can... I do. Um, because my I'll website... put that in the show notes. Okay. My website is www.abhats.com. A-B-Hats. Yeah. Dot now com. there is another company in England that stole our name. Oh, and they sell on Amazon and they're buy sell. They buy Chinese hats and they resell. So, uh, but, and they told us they were going to do that. But in order to get them not to do it, we would have had to hire a, a lawyer in England and take them to court. And uh, I said, right. let's not waste our time with that. So yeah. we have a disclaimer on our website that we're not that AB hats. But <laughs> yeah, that doesn't cause thing. us any problems, really. No. Well, that's good. Well, okay. I'm going to put that in the show notes uh, if, for this interview so people can uh, look. I'm also on Facebook. Website. I have a Facebook page oh, too okay. with the same name. Oh, okay. I will uh, list those then for them. Okay. So that takes me to, do you have any, um, well, challenges or goals in terms of future projects that you, you want to make sort of your bucket list idea? Yeah, I do. Of course I do. Um, I love the French flower making technique. And there are two women that are really well known for do for teaching this. And it's very intricate and very involved there. And there, there's one that's doing it with leather and the other one that does it with very fine uh, silk kind of fabrics. And you have to use these tools and you have to dye that each petal and you have to tool it. And then you have to assemble it. And it's very involved, but they're beautiful. And so it's kind of on my bucket list that I've got to acquire this skill set to incorporate it into my hat making because I don't have a really super expensive hat that has a lot of this built into it. I have basically the same price range hats. And a friend of mine said, you got to have your super expensive and then you're a little cheap so that you have a range of, you can, you can satisfy a range of customers right. price points. So if a customer came to you and wanted a, 
couture hat, a custom made hat for them, what would your procedure be with them? Like, how would you um, design it? Well, usually it's to go with an outfit mm. they have in mind. So I would want to see a photograph of the outfit. Right. And then uh, a photograph of them so that I can see what the colors are, what their natural coloring is and what the, the outfits is because the hat should complement the outfit mm. unless she wants the hat to outshine the outfit. Oh, okay. And then I have to get her head size and I would show her samples of straws that I have and trims that I have and let her sort of help me pick out what she wants. And right. then I would just sort of make up some samples and go from there. Okay. And see so what would be, without getting too specific, what would be the range of prices for you to make a hat for somebody, a custom hat? Mm -hmm. um, if I already have all the materials on hand, it's going to be a lot less expensive. Mm. But if I'm going to have to order all new stuff to accommodate her taste and her color choices and stuff, because I don't think I can dye it exactly the same color she wants it, then it's going to be higher. But I would say in the 200 to $300 range for something oh, like that. I'm surprised. I would have thought that that's on the lower side of what I was thinking some of these hats would cost. So, Well, because I'm a middle-class person, I don't want to usually... I don't want to like, you know, rob somebody for a one day sure. event <laughs> yeah, right. kind of item. I want yeah. them to really love it and, yeah. and it to be handed down to somebody. But, you know, if you, if you, if, if they feel like they're being, you know, squeezed, they're yeah. not going to like the hat that much. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And I, I, it sounds to me anyways, that you are more into the process of making these hats more so than having it as a business, so to speak. You're right. I mean, You're I'm right. sure that the money is very handy for buying more supplies and things exactly. like that. Exactly, exactly. But I, you know, sometimes it takes me a long time to make something because I don't quite understand what I have to do to get it there. I have an idea, but I don't know. I'm not, right. a, I'm not a construction, I'm not a civil engineer, you know? Yeah. So sometimes <laughs> my ideas on paper, I got to think backwards. Well, how am I going to get it to do that, you know? Right. Well, the next question is one I think we've already pretty much uh, touched on, but I'm just going to revisit it. Um, I have here, how would you describe yourself as an artist? And I, we've already talked about the fact that whether you're traditional, you tend to lean towards traditional a little bit, but I said it also looks like you're into experimentation and innovation. So I don't know if there's anything else you might want to add to that description. Um, and if there's not, that's okay. I don't want to put you on the spot or anything. I am good at knowing what I can't do. Okay. And, and so you, if I see something and someone's asking me, you know, can you do that? And I'll say, you know what? That's not in my skill set. Let me refer you on to someone I know who does that. Uh, okay. Because That's, I think not making false promises to customers is not a good idea. <laughs> it's just yeah, not best practice. No, no. And I think that just makes things for you much more complicated yeah. as well. So do you have any advice for anyone who might, you know, they'll see this and I'm sure like I feel very inspired by what you have shown me, what you have told me. And I'm sure other people will too when they see the interview. So do you have any advice to anyone who might want to get started in millinery? Um, jump in, but don't buy 5,000 hat blocks because hmm. you don't need them. <laughs> Come and see your husband. <laughs> Yeah, he doesn't do that much anymore because his <laughs> arthritis in his hands. Oh, yeah. But um, and I would say, check out Hat Academy and think of it in terms of a project. Pick a hat that is a project and then learn how to do that technique and then build on that. Because when you try to just do everything, you end up with nothing. Right, right. So if anybody wanted to reach out to you to to find out more about your hat making, um, I guess what they just go to your website or to your Facebook. And, yeah. and that's how they get a hold of you. Okay, well, yeah. I will put that yeah. information in the show notes. As yeah, I, I think said. My, my email is on my um, website page. Okay, great. So any final words before I say goodbye? Anything you'd well, like to add? I have to say that I like looking at your quilting because I find it very inspiring. And, you know, when I'm sewing, oh. um, you've influenced me to try a Bargello jacket. Ah. Bargello is a quilt style, yep. quilting yep. style. 
And yeah. so I've already started planning out this jacket that I'm going to make for the fall that's going to have like a quilting design on it. Ooh, and then I'm probably going to make a little beret to go with it. That would be very sharp and very unique, too. Yeah. Well, that's, so, so, that, that's, so, yeah. so yeah. You're, you, you know, I might inspire you, but you inspire me. And so. that's how it works in the artist community, I think, yes. really, if we're honest yes. about it. So we're not stealing the ideas. We're just being inspired to do a spin-off of something or whatever, whatever gets us going. Well, thank you so much, uh, Adrian, for this interview. This has been fantastic. Um, uh, well, as I you. said, I will post your information in the show notes as well. So people who might want to investigate you further will be able to do that. And just stay on the line. I'm going to stop the recording now, but don't go away. I'll be right okay. back.